everybody, welcome back. Again, I have a wonderful special guest, Dr. Alexa Altman, who is a trauma specialist. Is here, if you haven't watched our first video together, I encourage you to do that. The link is in the description, but today we're gonna to talk about coping with trauma and building those skills. Yes. Okay, so in our last video, you described the resilient zone, what trauma is, and the goal of trauma therapy. Yeah. When someone is working with you, what are some of the tips and tricks and things yeah. to help them bring themselves into the resilient zone? Exactly, because that's our first goal, right? That to know A, when you're bumped out, because that's huge, that awareness. Yeah. When I'm in the high zone, what does that look like? When I'm in the low zone, what does that look like? So mm -hmm. high zone just is more of that fight or flight, charge, anxiety, panic, anger, agitation. Maybe you're just like inside, right? Mm -hmm. Low zone is like, I feel like a robot. I can't, I'm just automated in my life or I can't even get off the couch, right? Yeah. So these skills are essentially to bring you back in to what is that range of resilience. Uh -huh. So some of the basic skills, like first things to start with, I would say is like using your eyes. And what does that mean? So I'd say first we use our eyes to look at things that feel beautiful, safe, mm -hmm. connected. So I say, I usually start with like, look in the eyes of somebody you love. And some people don't have. Yeah, you love. might not, but yeah. You might not, but you might have like a pet. Mm -hmm. And you might yeah. want to make contact with your pet because through our eyes is how we look for signals and signs of safety. So, oh, okay. Right? So if we're looking out and nothing around us is swirling, there's nothing chaotic happening. Right. We can, if there isn't someone or a pet, we could go to the park or listen to water rushing or something that's like right. watching something that's peaceful. Watching something. Hmm. But you know, you can like see something or look at something, it's a difference, right? It's really like yeah. taking something in yeah. with your eyes. It's like the difference between listening and hearing. Exactly. Like being engaged, exactly. like being engaged. visually engaging. And sometimes it can be really hard because you're intentionally having to move your system in a different way. Uh -huh. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about intentionally moving your attention towards safety and what that looks like, have to repeat that over and over and over again. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to remember throughout all of our videos together. And even other videos, I've talked about how important it is to stick with it because yeah. everything that we're going to do that is a challenge in therapy is yep. going to feel horribly uncomfortable. Yeah. Often I find the coping skills don't work the first time yeah. or it'll take five or six of them to yep. compensate for the one negative one that's we're trying right. to over override. So remembering that and keeping that in mind, I think is yeah. key to any treatment. That's right. Another quick, easy tip. This is often used more for people who are in the high zone. Mm -hmm. Low zone this is a little less effective. Is grounding. Mm -hmm. And so grounding is really the experience of your body in connection with the surface. So sometimes that can be sitting in your chair and actually feeling your body and the weight of your body against the bottom of the chair yeah. or on the back of the chair. And some people really, when they do that, they're like, wait, I can't feel my body because they're more in the mm -hmm. low zone, right? But if you're in the high zone, you're kind of feeling like you're crawling out of your skin of just feeling the connection of your body to the earth. And sometimes grounding can be done walking, but not just like mindlessly walking. It's really walking and feeling the bottoms of your feet. You're feeling the pressure of you actually walking. Pressure. It's interesting that that works mostly with the high zone, but it makes yeah. sense because if we're totally disconnected, That's right. how can we reconnect? That's right. That spark is harder to get started. It's harder to get started. Mm -hmm. So I always typically say for somebody in the low zone, it's just feeling sensation in your body. So you might try a hot shower and really letting yourself feel the water mm -hmm. against your skin and movement. So any mm -hmm. movement, it can be dancing, it can be yoga. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna do yoga and you're in the low zone, I highly recommend seeing a yoga therapist who's trained in trauma, who has uh -huh. some awareness. So she can do some gentle movement in yoga with some more knowledge about how trauma physiology works. Yeah, because there are things that, like heart openers that might not feel as safe and it might That's overcharge right. our systems. That's and right. If you know anything about yoga, know that there are people out there like that. Yes. Um, and if we have any resources, I'll put everything in the description so you can find some things in your area and something that could work for you. 
Alexa is going to give us some tips and tricks and ways to kind of bring ourselves back into the resilient zone. And so we've come back to the whiteboard yes. and teach us a little bit about what you yeah. teach your clients. Great. So one of the things that we know is that when you're in the high zone or you're in the low zone, that there, that there's an intentionality, like you have to work hard to direct your nervous system out of danger, essentially back into safety. Yeah. And so one of the things that's really important to know is that we have this capacity for our brain to change. It's a fancy word we use for the, the capability of the brain to change, and it can change throughout the entire lifespan. We're not just limited to childhood for that. No. Is neuroplasticity, which essentially means brain can change. And so you can teach an old dog new tricks. Absolutely. <laughs> totally, yes. And so one of the things that I think about for neuroplasticity is I used to ski with my dad when I was a kid, and we'd be the first one on the mountain to you know, ton of powder, and my dad would have this way, this big scare that he was, of like making these giant turns and, you know, creating a real track in the snow. And he did the funniest thing is he'd go back down the same way. Like he just liked making deeper and deeper grooves in the snow over and over again. So he'd do it, and throughout the day, he'd get faster and faster and faster. Because of course the you know the the snow gets sleek and mm -hmm. deep. You're packing it down. You're packing slowly. it down, right? And so that's really neuroplasticity. Is this idea is all of these skills that we're going to be teaching and doing. You're going to be doing those at home. Is every time you practice, you you basically create a deeper groove in the con neural connection in your brain. And I think it's really important. Notice it's like my dad would zoom up and down and up and down, but. This takes, this is a process of getting back up, going back, I'm saying skating back down, mm -hmm. doing the skills. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. What I see really happens often is, so let's say you do some grounding, or let's say you try to orient your eyes to something safe, and your system doesn't settle, and then you kind of give up on it. And essentially, the more you practice, and you can practice on your own, or you can practice with a safe person, um, the, the better your system gets at it, the faster and the more automatic it becomes. In the beginning, it's very intentional and then it becomes second nature. Oh, this is just what I do. Yeah, it's almost right? like I remember um, back in the day, I used to play softball when I was in middle school and we, I was on like this traveling team and I remember we would learn, like uh, we were not just throwing the ball, we were learning a little whip of the wrist huh. and I remember the coach coming around and saying I forget the amount but he's like it takes you know 10,000 times of repetition for this to uh, become an automatic thing right. that you don't think about and so in a way it's like we're gonna have to yes. keep trying these and keep doing it be yes. before it feels like an automatic that's thought. right and to like that's rewire right. it out of the unhealthy exactly way. in out of actually what has been a prolonged threat response yeah, right? exactly. That that the system is meant to come back into safety. It's just been a prolonged state. And I think it's really vital to talk about that because these skills are just useful to bring your system back into resilience. But also, if you're working with a therapist and you're doing trauma reprocessing, which I think we're going to talk more about mm -hmm. that, these skills are necessary to do that trauma reprocessing. So they're yeah. helpful therapeutic skills too on your way to recovery. Well, because if you're in therapy, like I work with a lot of clients who will struggle in the moment in therapy, right? Yes. And so we need to use those skills even there yeah. to remain in the resilient zone because something that Alexa taught me is that in order for trauma therapy to work, we have to maintain ourselves or to keep ourselves in the resilient, the resilient zone. zone in order to reprocess that material otherwise our brain isn't allowing us to do it it's That's like right. it's too overcharged or it's too undercharged and That's we can't right. heal it exactly exactly so they're really important skills for life and therapy. Yeah. Therapy. Yes. Yes. So we're going to be practicing something over and over do you have any specifics you start out with or certain things that you find are the most tried and true i know everybody's yeah. different and everyone's got something different that works for them but That's right what works the best in your experience? In, in bringing people back into their, their zone. So first I start out by just naming on a piece of paper mm -hmm. all the things that represent safety to you. Hmm. So it might be specific people, it yeah. might be places you've been, it mm -hmm. might be just your association to maybe even a place in your house. Interesting. That like, you know, people meditate in a corner of their house. Maybe there's a place in your house that's like your most beautiful, comfy, safe place. Mm -hmm. Or like something from childhood, like a comfy blanket or mm -hmm. a pillow or a picture of your grandmother. I say that because that's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I still have my yeah. blankie. 
Yeah. Still have your blanket. I do. Yeah. My grandmother's next to my bed. You see? Yeah. yeah. It's like you keep certain things around. You keep certain things around. So yeah. I see like make, make a list. Maybe it's a spiritual figure. Yeah. And so then you take that list and you write as much as you can about each of those things. Almost like free association, which is just like mm. write unedited as much oh, as you like can. Oh, like for grandma, for, you know, if I'm the, my like, grandma. like putting to my grandma, I'd be yeah. like, oh, and the, uh, making pierogies together. Yeah. And then, like Christmas time. Chocolate and... chip cookies. Yes. The mm -hmm. smell of her house, yeah. the color of the tile. Totally. What it felt like to touch her crinkly skin. Mm -hmm. Right? So you want to go through all of your channels of sensory information, the sights, mm -hmm. the smells, the touch. The taste. The That's taste, so interesting. The essence. And really what we're doing, okay, I'm going to try it. Mm-hmm is we're opening up your channels of association to safety. And so think about that, that's just not a mental construct, it's not a mental image, it's a full body experience of safety. Yeah. And if, if, you know, if I had it my way, I want as many channels of safety as I can. So it might be your grandma, it might be my child's the dog Poppy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right? It mm -hmm. might be this magical vacation I went on at 15. Yeah. You know? So you want to get a, as big of a list, and if you want to call some friends or family to help you come up with that list, because sometimes people come in my office, they're like, I don't have any. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, you've been alive a long time. <laughs> I'm sure there's at least I'm one I'm sure there's, there's one, mm -hmm. and let's just start with one. And I sometimes have people go call friends and family to help them think about some other ones. And so you're going to expand that list. And then as you expand that list, what's really important, another part of deepening this groove, mm -hmm. notice what you feel in your body when you are writing that list and you're thinking about it. So some of the things you're going to be looking for that tell you you're back into those channels of safety are usually warmth in the chest or warmth in the belly, mm, okay? Uh -huh. Often like a longer exhale. I was gonna say the, <sighs> the breath is so nice and the yeah. slow, and, yeah. We're gonna get back to that breath is a really good one. Is you know, your face might feel different. Some people, when you get back into safety, you're more aware of your face. Because mm. you're out of alarm and threat and you're kind of feeling a softer face. Oh, interesting. Usually the eyes get softer, mm -hmm. right? So I would say look for those indicators. It's like your cue that you're moving in the right direction. Even maybe less tense, and just maybe hands yeah. and muscles and stuff were not so. Less muscle construction. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, did you feel that? I'm yeah. just about to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that, that you're gonna feel the decrease of that muscle construction. So after you've done that, and I would say this is kind of like your resource book, some people even make a box and they'll yeah. put resources in that box. I have a lot of people who create the like self-help boxes, yeah. and distraction boxes, yeah. and putting all of your all of your items in there. Yeah, and you're rewiring your nervous system as you do that. You uh -huh. can visit your box. It's nice if you visit people too. Yeah. But yeah. if people aren't around, you have this other place mm -hmm. to go. Or if it's to the middle of the night, right? Oh, and middle of the night. That's sometimes the best. And then we have all of our things in yeah. there. So another thing is, if there's a safe person, I always say, ask that safe person to leave you a voicemail message oh, yeah. or send you a video of their face, their voice, and something you can carry in your back pocket because, again, it just grooves in your channels to safety and connection mm -hmm. with a safe other. And, and you can, can access any time. You can access any time. That's really yeah. cool. So another tip, another uh, um, tip, and you, you said this, Katie, about that big breath, is one of the things we know about our breath is when we're in that high zone, our breath is trying to mobilize us to meet. So it's fast and short. Like right, because we're trying to get ready to run. Uh -huh. Right? Or that freeze, which almost some people say, I, I forgot I wasn't breathing. Right? Yeah, the hold their breath I've seen. Slow yeah. heart rate, slower breath, because if you're feigning death, you don't need to breathe much. Mm -hmm. So you can intentionally do a longer exhale, like a four count. Uh -huh. Let all the air out. Right? Mm -hmm. So that longer exhale, we're going to be talking a little about this part of your nervous system that that longer exhale engages called the social engagement system. So, you know, when you watch a mom feed a baby mm -hmm. and they might be really fussy and stressed out and then they engage with the mom and they and, and the feeding's going well mm -hmm. and the baby's looking at the mom and there's that eye gaze mm -hmm. and they're sucking and swallowing and then their nervous system calms down, right? Uh -huh. That they're basically getting what's called through the social engagement system. Mm -hmm. They're so getting, sad. they're getting actually, they're they're wiring in 
experience of safety and connection. And that when that's done a lot, it's reliable. Mm -hmm. And I can get so stressed out, but I can come back into connection and be soothed, right? How interesting, yeah. So Stephen Porges, this really bright scientist, mm -hmm. discovered, wait, we don't just have this break in the nervous system that turns the lights out when we're really stressed out, right, and into freeze. We also have this calming system called the social engagement system that happens through eye contact, through sucking, swallowing, mm -hmm. through ears being engaged and hearing our, our social brains love voices. Mm -hmm. You know when moms talk to their babies like, oh, hi, honey, uh -huh. right? Yeah, the we like the voices that do that. Mm -hmm. It's very soothing to us. Oh, funny. That we're wired for that connection. It's what separates us from reptiles. Oh, interesting. It's what yes. makes mammals so adaptive and, yeah. And, and why we and like to be connected. in groups, right? Mm -hmm. Our survival depended on us cooperating mm -hmm. and being together. We would have not survived. We only have two legs and we're not that fast. I know, it's true. Right? <laughs> so we really needed that to survive. How interesting. And I think what's so cool when I learn about social engagement system is, you know, if it was thrown off early in life, let's just say... Yeah, mom wasn't there. There, there. was maybe yeah. she was ill. Yeah, maybe there were other things going on. Yeah, maybe we were. Uh, it was trauma, or maybe we were like even an incubator because we were born. Right. Like, they worry about the attachment with babies who are premature. That's right. That's right. Right. That that social engagement system becomes less reliable. Mm -hmm. That we tend to protect ourselves more with fight flight. So are there things yeah. then in relation to that? Yeah, if that's so vital. Yeah, that's, that's so vital. vital. Um, what are some things that we can do on our own yeah. or put in our boxes that we're already creating? I love that. If we're building that social engagement system, the mm -hmm. one in a way that's the most effective calming system, is that we want to build things that cue that part of our system. And that system is more related to, our, again, our eyes, our ears, our larynx, like our throat, and the muscles of our neck and head. So in our box, things that are visually pleasing, all mm -hmm. factor, our, our sense of smell is really right there in the very beginning of life. Things that are pleasing, maybe mm -hmm. it's the smell of someone familiar to us, mm -hmm. or maybe it's the smell of something that we had as a child, yeah. right? Yeah. That brings us back. So sounds would be important too. So it could be like creating oh, a playlist or music. Yeah, certain that's melodic, mm -hmm. right? That's melodic. So we tend again to like sounds that are yeah, the up, that and, up down, and down, and up, up and down. Like or Disney video. songs are like that. Yes, right? well, they are. They're so lullabies like that. are like that. That's the reason they yeah. get stuck in your head. I would assume forever, right? <laughs> and they all have that voice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. So even the video, like uh, Alexa mentioned before, the video yes. of someone that you love and care about could also yeah. be helpful because of the voice. But even the YouTube video, like I. I think YouTubers, right? You, you go on a YouTube and you see a friendly or familiar face. Yeah. And Your face. <laughs> no, really. Like you keep, you know, in a way building the connection to a friendly, mm -hmm. consistent, familiar face. Mm -hmm. And so that might be coming on yeah. and watching some videos. Yeah, it's true. And hearing a soothing voice that you're used to hearing. I've heard some of you think my voice is soothing. It's soothing. <laughs> Don't say the thing. It's, yes, you've got, you've got that soothing voice, yeah. right? And then the eyes, because we also like eyes that are warm mm -hmm. and engaging. You know, sometimes if you've had a lot of trauma, your eyes can feel kind of frozen, right? Where you feel like you you, you don't feel that same warmth and then that same connection and then so looking at eyes that are warm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So photos could even be good for that, photos. or videos as well, like we're talking. Yeah, about. and it can it can be somebody you know, mm -hmm. but oftentimes people in my office, will, Oprah comes up a lot. Some of the people you don't know, Gandhi. I mean, mm -hmm. so you can utilize that social engagement system with anyone. Yeah, even people you've never met that just have an impact yeah, on you and exactly. feel that safe and warm to you. Yeah. So and the other thing you just did, I had to just take mm -hmm. it because you did it, is you put your hand on your heart. Mm -hmm. So another way we can regulate, in addition to that long exhale and, you know, these friendly faces, is hand on heart and belly. Have you done this one? In yoga you do it. Yeah. So the heart and belly, right, of pressure. And it's interesting because... I think 80% of people do right hand on heart, left hand oh, on belly. Really? Okay. But you decide because it's uh -huh. very different than if you try one yeah. and then you do the other, almost everybody's like, oh no, I like this one so much. Yeah, better. it'll feel weird. It's gonna feel weird. It's gonna feel like, oh, that's just not soothing. So mm -hmm. hand on heart, hand on belly, and doing that long exhale is very soothing and regulating. It's so interesting for me as a yogi person how many yoga things are done to soothe our nervous system That's right. and to calm us down because right. all of the like hand on heart and stomach we've done the breathing obviously is a very key yeah. portion of it you know 
Um, even my yoga teacher does a lot of visualization. Like imagine that you're at this place that you love, pick a place, wow. and, you know, when we're like coming down from the practice. Yeah. And all of that is actually done to to soothe us. Yeah, this ancient wisdom. Maybe yeah. they didn't have the neurobiology, but they had the wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. As you build your boxes, your self-care, resilient, we'll call them resilience boxes. Mm -hmm. As you build those, okay. are there other things that they could add that yeah. work with the hearing, the neck, the throat? Yeah. So we're talking about really like bringing back online the social engagement system. So vocalizing mm. and, and what that vocal is, vocalizing does and working these muscles in the throat, and larynx and pharynx is again, it turns on that engagement system. So it could be singing. I used to be in choir, surprisingly. Enough. Really? Yeah, I got a scholarship for college. And so it was really, I, it's funny because I miss it sometimes and mm. I find it so soothing. Yeah. Even though it's actually almost a weird workout of sorts, but it's totally. like, it's well, you soothing. do this, right? And it kind yeah. of opens the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when we're singing, we're doing a longer exhale, oh, yeah. which is regulating to our nervous it's like system. It's forcing regulation. It forces. And then also listening and having those, that inner ear opening to sound oh, yeah. and harmonizing. There's a reciprocal nature where you're mm -hmm. having to like resonate with another mm -hmm. voice is all very connecting and regulating. How interesting. So if you don't have a choir, you don't have someone, you could sing with the radio. Yeah, in the car. You, yeah, and that's where chanting comes in in yoga mm -hmm. and spiritual practices. It opens, again, that channel of social engagement. How cool. Yeah. yeah. So along the lines of like the neck and the throat, and you talked about yeah. children, like um, when you're feeding and you're sucking and swallowing. Yes. Would like a sucky candy or yeah. a lollipop, a lollipop or something. Uh -huh. right? That's why people sometimes when they're stressed out, you see them doing yeah. right yeah. or smoking, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But part of that is that soothing nature around the muscles of the jaw and face. They're trying to get regulated. That's so interesting. Right. So throw so, some sucky candies in the box. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Sucky candies. So I'm really curious too if you, if your viewers can find other mechanisms to stimulate the muscles of their face, their eyes, their throat. Like, what else do you play around with it? Like, I'm curious. Yeah. As Let I'm us doing. know in the comments. Yeah. Because I think it's really great. The cool thing about the community is that everybody has different experiences and yes. different things that have worked for them. That's and so right. I think it'd be really cool to share what's helped you. Yeah. Is there a particular thing that you do or like something where it like massages your neck or, yes. you know, I know there's all sorts of things out there that are available. Yes. What works for you? That's right. Let us know. Well, thank you so much for yes. helping us create our resilience boxes yes. and understanding a little bit more about resiliency. And I hope that all of you found this really helpful. If you haven't watched our other video, make sure that you watch that as well. Click here to subscribe because we are creating a lot of videos. You don't want to miss them. And send me pictures, hashtag Kenyans, of your boxes. Have you created resiliency boxes? Let us know. We'd love to see those. And we will see you next time. Bye.